do that. That's who we're hanging out with uh, today. Kirsten, I'm so glad you're here. Kenner, thank you so much for the show. And I'm not bossy. My sister-in-law says I just have better ideas. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I get it. I dad. get it. Yeah. That was good. I like your sister-in-law. <laughs> and I love you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's going to be a fun conversation. I love it everything is. about real estate. It's going to add some value. The stuff that you're going to be talking about, that we're going to be talking about with the audience hearing and watching it, they're going to be at, they're going to get tremendous value. I can almost promise everyone out there that's the case. Uh, and we're going to open up very casual conversation. We get to talk about podcasting, videos. I mean, we get to talk about so many things. Why don't we go ahead and learn a little bit about your background? Because I think it sounds like a very interesting background, first of all. Okay, Kirsten? Sure. I actually started selling real estate in the late 80s, so I'm definitely aging myself. I eventually moved to the mortgage side, owned a mortgage company and a title company, and loved everything about it. 2008 hit. We survived, but we weren't thriving. But what I realized was I started, actually, one of my clients had asked me to mentor her. And so I was mentoring her and her business. I had a lot of other clients who, because I saw their business tax returns and their personal tax returns, they would want me to go to lunch so they could pick my brain. So I ended up mentoring business owners for about a decade before I actually started business coaching. Mm -hmm. And the client who is now my business partner, she was the one that really talked me into doing video marketing really early on. I think we were two, 2006, 2007 was when we started creating videos um, for YouTube for the marketing business. And it blew me away because I had no idea that when someone would walk into my office, they were so familiar with me and my dog and the team. You know, I'm, I'm racing around my head thinking, how do they know me? Like, where did I meet them? And you're feeling bad because they're really connected to you. And I don't know where I met them. The reality is I hadn't. They had just watched a lot of videos. So that was when I saw the power of video marketing, which kind of led me down this other journey that we'll talk about today. Oh, hold on. Let me stop you there. So it blows me away that everyone loves watching videos, but very few marketers use videos to the extent they should. There's a study out there. I forgot what the numbers are, but it just blows me away that so many people love watching videos, but there's so few videos out there. And just like you say, it gets you connected to people when you're doing the videos, even though you don't know you're connecting with them, but because they're watching all your videos. So that's partially what we're doing here is trying to, you know, connect with people. And I think that mm -hmm. some of the stuff we're going to talk about is going to really drive that home. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of reasons why business owners don't use video marketing. The first one is I think we're all insecure in some ways about being on camera. So I think for mm -hmm. a lot of people, it wasn't natural, especially, you know, we didn't grow up on social media. We didn't grow up, you know, documenting our daily life. So I think for a lot of business owners, it can feel just different and challenging. And we have a lot of ways to help people get comfortable on camera. But the other thing is when you think about video editing and cleaning up the audio and uploading it to YouTube and taking care of the SEO, it's a lot that goes into that. So for so many business owners, they just do not have enough hours in the day to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So then how do you get over that? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. You can hire an agency. So there's lots of businesses out there that will produce your videos. For us, a lot of our clients are more, they may be newer in business or they're just really focused on profit. So they want to be very um, conservative about how they spend their money. So we actually pair our clients with virtual assistants in the Philippines who've been trained on video editing, audio editing, graphic design for social media, email marketing, and blogging. That makes it very, very affordable for any business owner to get into the video game, which I think is so important. But Kenner, there's actually a flip side to this that I love so much. We're providing jobs for these lovely people halfway around the world, right? Our clients are generous. They're kind. They pay on time. They treat their virtual assistants like rock stars, and they keep their virtual assistants for years. And that's the other side that I'm really passionate about is helping people not get treated really well. If you're a virtual assistant, you should be treated really well. And we encourage our clients to treat their virtual assistant like part of their team, to bring them in as part of the team. And they can make, they can have a huge impact on your business. Uh, wow. You and I think alike. Uh, that was a leading question. I wanted to have you at least talk about virtual assistants, which, yeah, I know it's a big part of your business, but of your consulting side, at least. I think that, yeah, you know, I just wrote an email to all of my quote, well, you would probably call them virtual assistants, but we call them team members. They're part of our team. Mm -hmm. I really think of them as, you know, saying thank you because they've they've totally turned my business around, number one. Number two, I think that a lot of people just are afraid of that process. And thank gosh, you're there to help them along that process. I think virtual assistants are unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable as a category. Man, oh, wow. You and I are going to talk. Uh, I'm going to love <laughs> this. So let's 
actually first, how do people get a hold of you? First of all, because I think you have a lot of stuff that is going to provide value. Let's get that out of the way. First of all, how do people get a hold of you first? So they can reach me at sixfigurebusinesscoaching.com or you can find me on LinkedIn, Kirsten Graham at sixfigurebusinesscoaching.com. Uh, can you say that there. all very slow? Because I'm a slow thinker. Can you say that yes. all one more time a little bit slower? Yes. So our website is Six Figure Business Coaching, and that's S-I-X, Figure Business Coaching. And you mm -hmm. can also find me on LinkedIn at Kirsten Graham at Six Figure Business Coaching. And how's Kirsten spelled? And how's Graham spelled, just in case? K-I-R-S-T-E-N. Last name is Graham, G-R-A-H-A-M. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's start from the very beginning because uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm loving this. So uh, I, I believe you have two different services you provide that can add value to some of the viewers and listeners. Um, what are both of those? And let's kind of get into those and then add some value to these people. Sure. Absolutely. So I feel like we, what we do is, is done very differently. So you can hire a marketing agency and you can also hire an outsourcing agency to help you with the process. We act, I guess, kind of as an intermediary. So we coach our clients on their video marketing strategy, their content strategy, getting comfortable on camera. If they want to start a podcast, we help them with that. And then we actually pair them with a virtual assistant that we've interviewed, vetted, and trained. Mm -hmm. And that person has been through a paid internship for us. So we know that they can meet deadlines. We know they're great communicators. Mm -hmm. And what this does is it allows our clients to jumpstart the process because they're using all of our SOPs. It also makes it more affordable. So our clients pay their virtual assistants directly. So once they have paid us our flat fee, they can work with their virtual assistant for as long as they like, because like you said, we want them to bring that person onto their team, not think of them as just a virtual assistant, but think of them as part of their team. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our offers. Our second offer, we work a lot with coaches, consultants, authors, and speakers who want to get booked on podcast. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy to get booked on podcast. It's not hard. It's just crazy time consuming. Totally. So we teach our, yeah. Right. And I think that, um, you know, we've got two podcasts ourselves. And what I think you don't always think about is what does it take to be a good guest? What does it take to get onto the right podcast? You know, how do you know your topics are in line with that host? And how do you have clear call to actions for conversion to make sure you're actually benefiting from those guest appearances? Mm -hmm. So that's what we work with our clients on. And then we help them hire the right virtual assistant that we train to do all of the back end things again to get them consistently booked on podcast. Yeah. So, but look, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Obviously, I believe in podcasts sure. um, much more than I think I ever used to when we started back in 2021. Okay. Let me play devil's advocate. Dude, it's a lot of work to get on a podcast, even though you said it's not. But let's just say, eh, I think it's too much work. And is it worth it? What do you, What's your response there? So as a business owner, you only have so many hours in a day. And so I think it's very important that you decide how you're going to spend your time. So whether you're starting a podcast or do you, you want to be a guest on podcast, you need to look at it as a long-term strategy. And if you're not going to do that, then I would say don't do either, to, to be honest. Totally, totally. So it needs to be a long-term strategy. But for example, this is the second podcast I've been on today. And Dude, basically, nice. yeah. So basically the way it works out is my virtual assistant has everything in my calendar. It allows me to go through all of the notes and the forms that she filled out for you. <laughs> It gives me links to your podcast episodes so I can watch them again and refresh my mind. I go to your website. I check that out. So I do all of that before I jump on the call with you. So I know who you are, what we're talking about. And then basically, I just have to show up and add value to your audience, right? Mm -hmm. And then once this interview is finished, my job is basically done. Other than, of course, when the episode comes out, I want to market the heck out of it to show mm -hmm. you that I value and appreciate you bringing me onto your show. Mm -hmm. And that can be done by your virtual assistant as well. Yep. So for me, my time commitment is literally the little bit of research I do beforehand and then being here. And, and what I would say is, no, I'm going to still play devil's, devil's advocate. Man, if I want to start a podcast, it's really expensive. What do you say to that? So again, it's like any other marketing. It can be I very expensive. Tools. I meant the tool. Yeah. I, meant, I meant the tool. Some people think the tools are expensive. That's what I meant. Right. So whether you're being a guest on podcast or you're starting a podcast, it is good to have headphones and it's also good to have a mic, but you don't have to go with the highest end things out there. We often talk to our clients about, you know, you can buy a decent mic for 50 bucks. You can get de decent headphones for 50 bucks. Right now, I think you use Riverside. We still yep. record on Zoom. So you really can start wherever you want. If you're starting a podcast, you don't have to go all in with everything. And I can make you a promise. 
your first episodes will be terrible, right? Oh, <laughs> whether, whether it's you're terrible or the technology is terrible, but the reality <laughs> is we all have to start somewhere totally. and we believe yeah. in starting ugly and getting better. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is pretty funny. I remember our first, we're still horrible at, but I love them. I, I get to bond with you, get to bond with the audience. The audience calls in, you know, I love it. I just, I, I love it. I might, I, I might have a, a face for video or for uh, audio, but I don't really care if, people laugh at me, whatever, you know, it's part of my charm is the way I look at it. So wait a minute. So, okay, let's get a little bit more granular. So here we have a, have a, have a you know, a micro microphone, um, people have earphones. I've never understood, like with our audio capabilities, what we have our software, it makes it sound unbelievable. Number one, number two, it works. I can hear you. So I don't need headphones. Why do you think it's important to have both? Cause you cited that. So for me, I don't know if you can see this, but that's stained glass. So behind okay, yeah. me, that that's yeah. it's, it's a large piece of stained glass. So if I'm not though, using right? it is, it's glass. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if I'm not using headphones, that means that your voice is coming out here and you're it's facing this direction, it's gonna bounce off of that. Hmm. So for me, it's just better sound quality if I don't have your voice in the room. Got it. And then I'm, of course, talking directly into the mic, so that shouldn't mm -hmm. be bouncing. So mm -hmm. it's just about sound quality. But again, there's so many amazing things. Even using Zoom, you have tools like Descript now that can help clean up the audio really easily yep. and make it sound better. Yep, yep, totally. All right, so um, I think what, you, what you're good at, I think the most important thing of being on a podcast, so now I'm talking about being on a podcast, is kind of the kind of leveraging the audience, you know, you mm -hmm. leveraging my audience, me leveraging yours, and which we never did, embarrassingly enough. But what are some of your strategies in that regard? I guess somehow you're connecting via social media, probably before and then after, but what are some strategies that can add value to, uh, you know, a viewer or listener in that regard? Yeah. So if I'm showing up as a guest, I want to make sure I know who your audience is. I want to make sure that I'm adding value to that audience. I do want to connect with you on social media. Mm -hmm. If you, when you post your content, if you're tagging me, we're tagging you back and we're resharing that content. We'll often send it out to our email list. So there's lots of different things that we do to promote this episode to our audience, mm -hmm. just like you promoted it to your audience. And what's amazing is, you know, my background's real estate. And so when I first looked at your podcast, it was, you know, would I be a good fit or not? Because I'm not in real estate now, mm -hmm. but since we had a great conversation beforehand, we decided it would be. Mm -hmm. The thing I think I love most about being a guest on podcast or having a podcast is I feel like the host and the guest want to build real relationships. So who knows? There could be a collaboration down the road. There's, you know, there's so many opportunities for us to partner and do other things in the future as we get to know each other better. Yeah, it's uh, very rarely can you sit and chat with someone just kind of casually for an hour. Right. And I think that's one. I mean, you and I are getting a rapport. I get to know your deal. Mm -hmm. And who knows when I'm talking to someone, I'll think of you. Uh, because of this one hour conversation or what, what have you. I think it, it makes a huge difference. It really does. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, what you're doing is you're just, you know, as a host of a podcast, you're just trying to help your audience have information, right? You're just sharing with them. And I think that if you, sometimes people think, well, you know, if I put content out there, you know, maybe I'm not going to get business back right away. But if you sow enough seeds and this content is evergreen, eventually it's going to pay off, right? Sometimes it might pay off right away, but sometimes it takes time. But what you do have is you have evergreen content that's out there working for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A hundred percent. For me, let's talk about ever, not only evergreen, but let's talk about repurposing of mm -hmm. the content, which is an asset as I look at it. Because we re, that's, that's what we do. I mean, we have this video, we'll be able to split it up. Obviously, I'm not smart enough to do it. My team does it, but they, they split it up into small little snippets and put it on every social media you can think of. Mm -hmm. um, they also, we also sometimes put it behind a paywall. So we charge for it, depending on the circumstances, because we have a webinar that we call VastCast. Um, sometimes, you know, it, it goes to YouTube automatically nowadays, I think it is. Um, then we, um, we use a transcript and then we can put it on medium or, you know, use it as a blog. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many different ways to use it. People are crazy for not, no offense if you're not in the camp, but people are crazy for not repurposing the content. So what are some ways you think it makes sense for repurposing the content? Everything you said, and then definitely mm -hmm. also mailing it out to your email list. The other oh thing yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And track the content because if we post something that gets a lot of traction, we may want to post it again in a few months. So if you have things that really take off, 
don't just think about repurposing them once, but maybe over the holidays when you're, you're maybe you're not having a you know a couple of episodes go live um, during the holidays. Look at all of the most popular posts you put out there and repost them. Totally, and that goes to now. As I mentioned, I was going to bring up uh, evergreen content. Um, how do you make sure it's evergreen content? Is that something that's part of your normal protocol? Yes. So. A lot of times our clients are real estate agents or law firms, spas, a lot of local businesses are understanding the values of starting a YouTube channel for SEO. So it can really help with search engine um, optimization. It can help people find them. So for them, the content strategy, you know, some things won't always be evergreen. So in other words, if you are showcasing maybe a new builder's home, eventually that house is going to be sold, but that mm -hmm. builder's still around and that neighborhood's still around. Or if you're talking about market conditions right now, that may change. But again, you're adding value at that moment. So not everything will always be evergreen, but mm -hmm. the majority of the content should be evergreen. And like for our lawyers, you know, they have so much value and so much information. And generally, if someone needs to speak to a lawyer, you know, in some cases it's been they're injured or, you know, there's something that's they're getting a divorce or something's going on in their life that isn't necessarily positive. So if they can watch videos and really feel like they know that attorney and they feel like they can like them and trust them, then it makes it so much easier to pick up the phone and call them. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you when someone reaches out to you because they watched your video or they listen to your podcast, they're almost always already sold. Yeah, They're huh. just waiting for you, right? They're, they're, they're sold because they like you. They like who you are. They like you know, how you talk. You know, I'm talking with my hands. People see that. So yeah, so I think that's the kind of evergreen content you want to think about, but you also want to think about SEO. You want to think about your strategy, both long-term and short-term, and then actually what are your goals within that YouTube channel or podcast? Now, a lot of our other clients, like I said, that are coaches, consultants, authors, or speakers, they're more likely to start a podcast. Um, they will put it usually on video and audio, but sometimes they'd rather just start off as a guest. It's a mm -hmm. lot easier to guest as a pod, on a podcast than it is to start a podcast. And so for a lot of people, we recommend they start there. Hmm. Okay. So let's get to that in a minute. So I have some questions there, but uh, you mentioned some goals. You talked to me, you used the term goal. Um, what about people who want to monetize their podcast? What are your thoughts on that? Well, obviously for your YouTube channel, you start getting monetized once you've hit uh, 4,000 subscribers. 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours, they can start running ads on there. But I think for a lot of the platforms with our clients, we don't focus as much on monetizing it outside of your offer. So we always focus on initially sell what you sell, become the expert in what you do and build your audience that way. And then you can look for other opportunities, whether it's collaborations or affiliate marketing. There are lots of other things you can do on your podcast or on your YouTube channel to start to monetize it. Mm, I understand. So then what, let's go back to the question earlier. So what are some hacks that you have that get people on um, whatever podcasts that uh, you found that are working? As far as getting them on podcasts as guests? Yeah. Yeah. I think it boils down to something really basic, which is one, making sure that they're a good, a good guest, right? Mm, if yeah. I'm a good guest, you're likely to invite me back. If I'm a good guest, you're likely to recommend me to one of your friends that has a podcast. Mm -hmm. So I think showing up and being confident, being grateful, all of those things makes a good guest. So that's the first thing, making sure you're going on the right podcast with the right audiences. So you want to make sure that that person's audience aligns with what you sell and what you do, and basically mm -hmm. also your value system. So I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And then I think the main thing is to bring value. If you can truly help people, then they will want to learn more about what you sell. And you and I are talking a lot more about what I sell than I normally do. Yeah, so normally I just talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. But you had a lot of questions about it. So it's, it's a fun conversation. But yeah, if you get an opportunity to have a conversation and maybe at the end of that conversation, you pitch your offer or you, you know, talk to people about, you know, how you can help them. But the reality is bringing great value is what's going to make people like you, trust you and want to reach out to you. 100%. That totally makes sense. And again, being a dead horse, but I think podcasts are just such a great way of doing that, you know? Mm hmm. All right. So many questions, still a lot of questions. I'm one of those guys, Mr. Inquisitive, right? Um, let's say someone has a podcast. Let's say someone has started a podcast and they have, I don't know what a measly number is or what someone would consider a measly number. Let's say they have an audience of a hundred. What are some of the advertising hacks that you think can add value to that podcaster? Well, they can always run ads to their episodes if they want. So you can spend money just like you can mm. spend money for your YouTube channel or anything else. So you can always mm -hmm. spend money and advertise it. But if you've started your channel and you have, you know, a hundred people watching it, 
you know, are they connected with you? Are they connected with you in any other way? And if so, like, are they on your email list? Is that audience on your email list? Are you providing good content in that regard? So not just with your podcast content, but what you're sending out to your email list. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think we forget that our audience is often not just listening to us or connected to us in a lot of other ways. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. The rule of seven, you have to connect with uh, uh, usually someone who's going to become a client seven times before they become a client. And I think if it's podcast, good way of doing this, email, good way of doing this, then social media. So, and you reminded me, we, we are kind of a joke, frankly, at all marketing, sadly, um, even though we've been around since 1969, but we are very good at email marketing, meaning blast email marketing to our existing contacts in our database. And I think a lot of people don't take advantage of that and having them pointing to, as, as an example, the, the podcast, because that's a great way to leverage. A lot of people have you know pretty good email list, but they don't kind of leverage that. Like, I don't know if we are, frankly, but, you know, I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, I'm laughing because, you know, when I when I'm actually working one on one with clients, which I still do sometimes. I love when I ask, do you have an email list? And it's like, yes, I've got, you know, a thousand people or 800 people or 10,000 people, you know, they're excited about it. And I, so when's the last time you emailed them? Oh, I haven't, or it's oh. been months, you know? Yeah. So an email list, you really have to nurture it and take really good care of it. If you think about it, these are people who've raised their hand. They said, I like you enough to get your emails into my inbox because I want to learn more. And if you just disappear, that's not good, right? Or if you're sporadic, you don't email on a consistent basis, then they forget who you are and they forget that they signed up to be on your mm -hmm. email list. So kind of treat those people like gold. You know, don't spam them with junk, but send them quality content. And if you do that, they'll become lifelong customers and, and raving fans. Yeah, I'm so embarrassed to say this. You know, I mean, we've amassed a huge email, what I would consider a pretty huge email list. And we just, we didn't email. I mean, people got to the point where they were kind of demanding that we send them more emails, which is crazy, by the way. Um, we have a huge open list, uh, open rate, which I love. But we were in that camp and it made no sense for us. I remember I was talking to a consultant once. He said, you know, I said, we might only email our, our clients when we you really have to get like one guy something or one girl something, right? Versus blast email. And he said to me, he's like, what, don't you love your clients? And it, that just kind of hit home. It's like, well, wait a minute, we must not if we're not giving them content that can add value to them. And that's really what a blast email campaign can do if you're doing it correctly, providing value to the people who are, you know, who theoretically should love you, you know? Yeah. And the software has gotten so amazing. So you can categorize people. So they're only getting the content that's important to them, if you know what that is. And I think that's really powerful too. You know, if someone is not right for a certain offer, you don't have to send them that particular offer. Or if you know they want more content on a certain topic than, you know, other people. So for example, lawyers, real estate agents, local businesses is a little bit different than online businesses. So mm -hmm. we can break those up and then send content that's more relevant to them. Yeah, that's perfect. Man, you do know your stuff, you can tell. So uh, nice work there, Kirsten. Um, um, so let me ask a few other questions then. What am I saying that for? Of course, I'm going to ask questions. That's what I do, right? Um, uh, we've talked about, you know, Riverside and Zoom. What are some other kind of tools that you think can add value to some, let's say, a, a brand new uh, podcaster to someone who's been around for whatever, a couple of seasons? Okay, so first of all, I'm not tech savvy. <laughs> So ah. I'm probably the worst, the worst person to ask. So whether it's starting a YouTube channel or a podcast or even being a guest, my thought is always path of least resistance. Do what is easiest for you to do so you'll do the thing, okay? Mm -hmm. You could always work your way up. Like I said, we're still hosting our two podcasts on Zoom. Should mm -hmm. we move to Riverside? Should we move to something else? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But right now we know it's easy for our guests to get on and they don't have mm -hmm. any problems or challenges. So that's, that's one of the th things we take into consideration. Sometimes for me, my camera or my mic won't always attach to Riverside. So wow. literally before this, yeah, before this interview, mm. I actually closed every window out. I completely shut my computer off and brought it back up mm. to make sure that it would connect. Mm -hmm. So that's just something I figured out. It works. Maybe I don't need to do it every time, but I'd rather do it every time. So mm. when you know I show up here, my camera's on and my mic's working. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't think there's any right or wrong when it comes to technology. Just start where you are. Start with what you can afford. Start with what you're comfortable with. And just do the thing because it will pay off. I totally agree. So I was in a podcast group and they, you know, a brand new person was saying, I'm thinking about doing a podcast. What should I do? Hear me out. What do you think of this? I basically said, talk to your friends, find out what they think your passion is, 
then of course you're going to probably know your passion, right? And then think in terms of them, the potential audience of that passion, okay? Well, let's say you come to a conclusion that you want to do something on uh, riding a bike. I don't know. Uh, as an example, do three episodes. Don't send them to anyone. Just do three episodes and that's it, right? Look at, see how bad those were. See how you can improve. Mm -hmm. Then go back and do basically a, an outline for the next 10 episodes. Go live, if you will. Make as many mistakes you have to. It doesn't really matter. And then after those 10, and sure, that might be too many, but uh, just go with me on this. And then after those are, quote, in the can, then do 10 more, right? Again, this is all, go with me on this. 10 more, and then start advertise the first three being short, the next seven being long, then advertise those as they're going to be launched. So why am I saying that? Because you're going to make a lot of mistakes along the way, and you're going to be so mm -hmm. much happier as you get going. And then when you get eyeballs, you'll be so much happier because those eyeballs will appreciate the final seven in that case that you've done. Does that make sense? Kenner, I totally agree. Sometimes we think we have to start off with perfection. Right. So again, whether you're starting a podcast or a YouTube channel, if you don't want to use those first two, few episodes, don't. Right. You have mm -hmm. to practice at some point, but there's also a lot of magic in video editing and audio editing. So True. sometimes I love when I hear our clients say things like, oh my gosh, you know, I was so worried, but when I got this back from my virtual assistant, she made me look good. <laughs> you know, she yeah. used amazing B-roll and she cleaned up the audio and she did these things. So also you need to lean into the person who is producing the video or the podcast for you. Hmm. Let's talk about that. So would you say that's almost a kind of a cost of goods sold? You have to have an assistant because, I mean, it's so much more efficient or would you say, eh, Let's say someone wants to just do it all alone. What are your thoughts there? So time is money. So mm -hmm. I guess it depends on where that person is with the scale. So I don't think there's a right or wrong, but I do hear quite often that I, especially from women, I need to know how to do everything in my business before I can delegate it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, you do not. The fact I would rather know how to do less things because mm -hmm. then I'm not getting sidetracked doing things that are not my unique ability, things I'm not great at. So if you absolutely love video editing and you love ed audio editing and you, it's always something you've wanted to learn and you have time, go for it. But if you're not making the money you want to make in your business, then it is not worth your time. Hire someone to have them do it for you. They'll do a better job. You'll, let, you'll enjoy doing your podcasts or your videos a lot more because you just have to focus on the content. And guess what? Someone halfway around the world is making money doing what they love doing, working in their unique ability. And I think that's powerful. Two things there, kids. If you heard what she said there, now think about it. First, you said eh, basically it's very, very important to have, uh, you know, it's basically part of a cost of goods sold, meaning, you know, people have computers, people have whatever, pens, paper, phones. Uh, you also should have uh, an administrative assistant or a virtual assistant or something. It's just kind of very, very, very important is what you're saying, really. Number one, and I totally agree with that. Like if you're going to buy a computer as part of your business, you also have a need to have an assistant to kind of get you going. You also said the words vert, um, unique ability. Um, mm -hmm. Without even knowing your background, I know that you're a Dan Sullivan fan. Yes. Or, well, yeah, or, or you're really into strategic coach. Why don't you real quickly go into that? Because I, I can tell that's probably helped your business a huge amount. Yes. So I spent three years in the strategic coach program, which I loved it. I was living in Virginia at the time. And my friend um, had just left a partnership and started her own law firm. So we agreed to do that together. Mm -hmm. And I think Strategic Coach is such a powerful coaching and training program. The principles and the values that they teach, I think, are you know, spot on. And I do love the fact, whether you call it your unique genius or your unique ability, there are things that we are all gifted at doing. And mm -hmm. the more time we can spend doing that, the happier we're going to be the more people we're going to serve. And it also, again, allows other people to do what they're great at doing. Look at you. I think that it's made me, we we're, we're, we take off Fridays, obviously Saturday, Sunday, we take off 10 uh, federal holidays a year. Um, then we also, basically the way we make it is we work half the year uh, at vastsolutionsgroup.com because we believe in a work-life balance. I was just talking to one of our teammates just a few moments ago, and they were talking about the work-life balance, and they appreciate that here at VastSolutionsGroup.com because we we do that. And I think a lot of that came from, you know, the, the time breakthrough that uh, Dan Sullivan coaches. That's the reason I asked. I think that can add a lot of value to a lot of our people out there. So it's pretty cool you're doing that. I mean, that shows that you're behind your career. You're doing something for work-life balance and also to 
help you succeed, which I'm sure is helping a bunch of clients to succeed. Yeah. And I think, you know, with Dan, with the whole coaching program, he does talk about bringing in the experts. So we do spend time doing what we're great at. But like you said, most people in strategic coach, we don't work on Fridays. We do take more holidays off. We tend to vacation more because Mm -hmm. again, we work hard, but we also want to play hard, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. But Mm -hmm. I think also, I don't know, were you actually in his program for a period of time? I I had one of his students teach me for years. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I just, I'll never forget the first session we went to, you know, we're sitting there and I drug my friend along because, you know, this has been 17 years ago that we were with mm. strategic coach wow. okay. and most, yeah. And most of the time there's not a lot of women. So in these types of things, there mm. tends to be a lot of men. So I drug my friend along so that I would know at least there'd be one other female in the room. And there were actually four of us total and about 25 men. So and that's usually, that was usually the balance back then. But the first question our coach asked us, his name was Jan. He said, when are you going to die? And he's standing at the front of the room. And that's the first question. And you're thinking, like, I don't know that this is what I signed up for. (laughs) (laughs) But everybody kind of wrote their answer down. And then what he did was he said, let's all start brainstorming on a whiteboard. He was writing. We were talking about what makes a quality life a quality life. And, you know, it doesn't help to have a very successful business if you have terrible relationships or terrible health. Mm -hmm. So we ended up writing all of these different things on the board. And one of them was social connections, which I want to circle back Mm -hmm. to in one second. But so then after we did all these things on the whiteboard, he said, now write down how long you think you'll live if you do these things. And we all put another 10 to 15 years on our life expectancy because now Mm -hmm. you realize that everything is about balance and we know we know what it takes to live a long and healthy life. And I was telling someone earlier that there's a lady in one of my networking groups because I do network locally because I like to get out and be a part of the community. She's Mm -hmm. 80 years old. She just got back from an African safari. You would never think she's a a day over 60. And she has the energy of, I don't know, the Energizer Bunny. Mm. And she looks great, right? But part of that is the social connections that she has. She is out living her life. She has people in our groups to go dancing with her, to have dinner with her, go walks on the beach with. She has, even though she has family and grandkids, she still enjoys having other business owners to communicate with and to talk with and to dream with and talk about, you know, all the things that we business owners like to talk about. Mm-hmm. So I think the, the connections make a big impact in our, in our happiness. In our work life, home life, everything. It really, it's really yes. the fundamental element of everything if you really think about it. Yes. That's a good way to start a meeting, by the way, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, exactly. Um, enough about So uh, let's go back to your business, not Dan Sullivan's, although it's great. But um, although I think maybe yours is better. It's going to help more of our listeners, I can tell you that, our viewers. Um, all right, let's go. All right, what's one example that you can think of, case study, where someone's completely turned their life around because of your coaching? Turn their life around. Let's start with something simple. So we started working with a real estate agent. I think she had been with us about nine weeks and she had a YouTube. Yeah. She had a YouTube channel that was up for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So she was with us for nine weeks and she hired a virtual assistant within three weeks of working with us. So her Mm -hmm. virtual assistant had been up and running for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And she basically came on and said in two years, I never had anyone reach out to me since I've had my virtual assistant in the past six weeks. I've had three people reach out to me from my YouTube channel and one is under contract. And she said, I won't get paid on it right away because it's new construction, but at least it's under contract. So it's having someone who can do the things when it comes to creating a great YouTube video. It's about what does that thumbnail look like? What about the title? You know, all of the things that need to happen to make sure that people are actually finding that video. And then once they watch the video, is it interesting? Because our videos have a lot of B-roll in them. I mean, You know, you're a good looking guy, Kenner, but people may not want to look at us for an hour, right? They may prefer to see some B-roll and some images and something interesting to keep their visual, you know, to keep them visually stimulated. So I think just making little tweaks and little changes make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Another client, um, she has a podcast, but she on her second or third podcast interview. So this is her becoming a guest on a podcast. She ended up freaking out because she's texting me like, I'm getting all of these people you know, opting into my email list. And so she ended up with a little over 70 people. Nice. She actually Wait, hold on. How'd she, whoa, whoa, hold on. In her, what do you mean by that? That might be kind of cool. What do you mean? So she went on a podcast as a guest. So yeah. she did a guest interview. Yeah. 
Got and it. all of a sudden her phone is dinging because she's seeing all the people that are opting into her email list because she offered a free guide. She got smart. So all, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All these people are signing up for this awesome free guide. And then she had um, people call her office and she ended up getting new, two new clients out of it. Dude, nice. So, yeah. So when you think about either having a YouTube channel or a podcast or guesting on a podcast, it really does put you in front of the ideal audience and it can convert really quickly. Dude, nice story. You totally turned that lady's life around. Nice work. Thank you. I think her virtual assistant did it. <laughs> I'll give you credit. Yeah, but you get credit because you're the one who kind of walked her down that path, it sounds like, correct? Well, thank you. Yes. We we love what we do. Nice work. I like that. Um, for So wait a minute. So your friend or your colleague or your assistant, or I should say, no, your student gave out something. It sounds like that worked out for her. Do you do something that... That's kind of similar. Do you give out a whatever a free guide when you're a participant in a podcast or what we call partners? You're a partner in this case. Uh, do you give out anything free that can add some value to the audience? Sure. Kenner today and for your audience only. <laughs> I have a guide. It's called Double Your Income with a Marketing Virtual Assistant. And you okay. can get that at outsourcingforbosses.com. Outsourcingforbosses.com. You walked into that one. <laughs> That was pretty good. All right. I'm, I'm gonna, I got to throw some tough questions at you. So uh -oh. you and I, well, we've talked twice, actually. Um, but no, the whole experience, because I want you to actually be be frank. Um, you've had the whole experience with me. We had one, somehow we met, number one. Then number two, we had a call or a Google Meet. And then now you've been on the, the show for, well, let's say, half the show, a little bit over half the show, right? What should I have done differently for it to be the most successful podcast that you can think of. So I'm, I'm looking for some criticism. Maybe it can make me better and maybe it'll make some of the viewers or listeners out there that much better at their podcast too. And I, I don't care whatever, whatever you say, I'll take the heat, but I want to hear what your thoughts are. To be honest, I, I don't have anything off of top of mind. I mean, hmm. you do a great job because the Riverside link was in the Google um, invite. So I had that easily available. Okay. You definitely communicated um, with emails for reminders. Did my staff, my by the way, did my staff do that also? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. They, they're probably automated. I know all of ours are automated, but yes. Yeah. 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 So I, I think this has been a great experience. One of the things that you do that we also do is we talk to the guests before we actually hit record. So we could have a fun conversation and get to know them, make them feel more comfortable. You definitely did that. Mm -hmm. And you're just a fun guy to have conversation with. So uh, I'll give you 10 stars. Nice. I paid her to say that, guys. Um, <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about the engagement with you as far as, uh, let's say, I want to be a, a, a student of yours. How does that work? If that's what you call them. How actually does that work? The Kind of the logistics. Yes. So basically, as coaches, we have recorded trainings because sometimes it's easier to have things recorded to teach people rather than trying to teach it all live. So when you decide to work with us as in the marketing BA advantage, the first thing that happens is you get a login and access to a portal. So you can start learning everything you need to know about getting comfortable on camera, your keywords, starting your YouTube channel or starting your podcast. But every week we do a live coaching call. So every week we're there to coach the clients. We like to think of it as a done with you. So if you're have, struggling with your keywords or, you know, you're trying to figure out if your background looks good, whatever it is, we're there to work with you on that. Once you're ready to hire your virtual assistant, we host what I call a meet and greet where I introduce you to three different virtual assistants. It's not an interview because our team has already interviewed them, vetted them. They've been through the training portal. They've been through a paid internship and they have to graduate that internship before we let them actually meet clients. Mm -hmm. Once you decide on the person you want to work with, that person goes directly to work for you. And we've given you everything you need for onboarding them, tax forms, everything. So we like to think of what we've done is done for you. We want to do as much of the work as we can for our clients so that when their VA is up and running, it's just smooth sailing. And so same with our other program. It's all recorded. We do a live coaching call for that each week. And whether it's helping you figure out what the right podcasts are, a lot of times I think the biggest challenge with that one is having call to actions that suit the conversation. So making sure whatever topic you're talking about, you have great call to actions. So whether it's that free guide, you know, I can say you guys are all welcome to go to the website and book a call with me, hmm. but maybe you don't know me well enough for that yet. So maybe you would rather you know, sign up for a lead magnet, you know, that guide, mm -hmm. and then let us kind of nurture you a bit before you decide, hey, I definitely want to talk to that person. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think that both of our programs work the same way. And one of the things that we try really hard to do, we actually worked with a person who creates curriculums and for colleges. 
And our biggest goal was business owners are busy, right? Mm -hmm. And most people will think, well, I don't have time for a course or a program. And I agree with that. So everything that we teach in the recordings are very concise, very to point, just what you need to know to get your part done. And then basically your virtual assistant does everything else. So that's the goal is to have the business owner do as little as possible. Mm -hmm. So either show up as a guest and do a great job or to have a guest on your own podcast or record a YouTube video and to be done with it and then have a virtual assistant that can knock out everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I think our checklist actually for YouTube production is like 72 steps. Whoa. So, yeah. But again, they're not doing it. They're just, yeah, they're you know, it's not, a yeah. way for the, yeah. yeah, it's a way for their team member to keep track of what's happening with each particular project. So we're very big at organization, project management. And again, we lead people, we manage workflows. Uh, I almost threw up when I heard 72, but uh, I think it, th that sounds about right. I mean, it's a lot of work, but if you have someone, an essential someone team member doing it, pff, then you're good to go. And the value that they add, I don't know what you guys pay your, uh, your teammates or your virtual assistants, as some people call them, let's say it's whatever, 2 to $10 an hour. It's totally worth it because it'll, if you sell right. usually a, a US-based product, if it's a, whatever, a $1,000 an hour service or $500 an hour service, whatever the number is, usually it'll come back many times over based on the work of that virtual assistant. Yeah, that goes back to the evergreen content. You think about it, you do the interview once and it's edited and put out there. So it's working all the time. So if you have your own YouTube channel or your own podcast, yes, you're paying that virtual assistant to do the work to produce it. But once it's produced, it's working all the time for you ongoing. Mm -hmm. So you're really leveraging your time and their labor. And for some reason, I'm not sure why, I don't even know if it's true, but I, I feel as though people listen to older podcasts sometimes more so than they would reading older content or watching older YouTube. I don't know if that's true, but that's my feeling because I look at our numbers. We had a small little tiny, teeny bitty uh, podcast in 21 and 22, and we still get a few numbers on that. It's like, wow, that, that's kind of surprising. What would you think? Is that your thought as well? Yeah, I think definitely. And because, you know, especially with YouTube, because as a search engine, someone puts a problem in, you know, is it ethical to hire a virtual assistant? Because that's mm -hmm. a question we get quite often and I have a video on that. Mm -hmm. So that video gets a lot of playtime. You know, it's years old, but people still pull it up mm -hmm. because they're trying to figure out, you know, is it ethical to hire someone halfway around the world, you know, where it's really cost effective. And obviously the cost of living there is about 85% less than it is for us. So yeah, if you're creating content that people are looking for, they're definitely listening to your older content. Yeah, that, let's talk about that. Cause that brings up a really good point. I used to feel guilty. I, we started <laughs> using uh, VAs back when, uh, I'm gonna say 98, early, we're early, right? And I felt mm -hmm. so, so guilty. Cause I thought, oh my gosh, I'm paying someone. I don't remember how much it was. Let's just say it was $3 an hour or whatever. Right. I felt so guilty paying someone three dollars an hour, but but it totally helped them in their community. And they were kind of rich in their community, as an example. So that made me feel in the end, I feel pretty good that I'm helping someone. Now, the question is, well, are you taking that job away that could have been U.S. based? I feel a little guilty about that. But then again, you got to be in my opinion, that's a little myopic. You got to be thinking worldly. I'm helping someone. Number one. Number two, maybe I'm providing a service in the U.S. because of my low cost basis, which I wouldn't have been able to help. A, maybe a U.S. based client, as an example. So there's a lot of give and takes. Um, plus, some people say, and I might be uh, in this camp. Some people say that people in the, as an example, India or Philippines, might even be harder workers. So I mean, there's a lot of benefits there. Yeah, it's really funny because they've had a heat wave in the Philippines, and one of our, our operations manager needed to take a couple of days off because the internet was going in and out, yeah. um, electricity was going in and out, just because it was so hot. And of course, we're like, yeah, we're, we're fine. We get it. We understand. And what was really awesome was a few days later, we had had a meeting with her that morning and we were just talking about some projects that were coming up. And after she's not in a person that shows a lot of emotion, she kind of keeps everything close to the chest, so to speak. But we got a message from her saying, you know, I was able to buy an air conditioning for my room and I was able to buy an air conditioner for my parents' room. I never thought I'd be able to afford one, but I was able to buy two. So we know her next goal is to have a generator. So it, it makes a big difference. Like it changes their lives so much. But when you think about hiring stateside, and this was a great example, we had a client who she did professional organizing mm. and she would stay busy. Sometimes, you know, she would get a little bit busy. So she was managing it all, trying to juggle it. 
but eventually she hired a virtual assistant and then she got her, you know, she got busy consistently. So it wasn't a roller coasters. And then what happened was she was able to hire other local organizers to work for her. So because she nailed down the marketing and stopped having the roller coasters, she was then able to start employing other organizers locally. So she's providing jobs. So I think that we have to look at it. Like you said, there's a lot more that goes into it. But I think the biggest key is, do you treat your people well? That's that's what makes it ethical. Dude, that's that's way to come close to ending this based on that note. That's unbelievable. So um, what I'm going to say, man, that, that kind of brings a tear to my eye. Nice work. Um, uh, why don't we, how about this? I'm going to throw another hard question at you. What's one thing that we have talked, that we, we have not talked about that you think can add value in any regard for someone who's thinking about getting into podcasting as an example? So I think there's, there's different ways to do podcasts. Obviously you can just, it can just be you. So you could do a solo podcast. Mm -hmm. I think having guests is the most amazing type of podcast mm -hmm. because, you know, we get to interview people on topics that we want to learn about, right? Kind of so selfishly and you get to meet and make great connections. So I think if you're thinking about a podcast, I think it's always about your reason why, why do you want to do it? Because it will get hard at some point, you know, or you may not feel like jumping on an interview or you may not feel like, you know, that host, that guest that's on your podcast, you know, maybe you didn't jive with them or maybe you felt like you were off. But if you have a strong why for why you want to do it, you know, are you trying to build your brand? Are you trying to, you know, find collaborations? Are you looking to have evergreen content? If you understand the reason why you're doing it, then it'll make it easier to consistently do it. The other thing is get the help and the support you deserve in your business. Yeah. And Kenner, one of the things that I found really fascinating was when we first started helping our clients with the virtual assistants, I heard things like, I feel like a real business owner. I had no idea how isolated I felt in my business. I had no idea yeah. how much I was beating myself up because I couldn't get it all done. So one thing I think business owners need to understand more than anything else is you deserve to have support in your business. If you want to help and serve a lot of people, you need that support. The people mm -hmm. that are supporting you with, with other tasks, things that you're not doing, it, it changes your life. It allows you to take those Fridays off. It allows you to increase revenue. It allows you to, to go to the next level. Whatever that looks like, it's hard to get there alone. And you don't have to. That's the best thing about outsourcing overseas is you don't have to go it alone. That's a really good closing remark. And that actually kind of ties into us. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we do taxes. We do tax strategies for business owners. I'll throw this out as a question for you. Um, let's say someone starts a podcast for whatever. No, as a business. Uh, are they allowed to do uh, take that out as a deduction? I don't know, Kenner. Uh, <laughs> I would say yes, but I write everything off. You, you might find me an, an IRS <laughs> jail one day. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, no, the answer is exactly right. Because if you're a W-2 employee, it's very difficult to lower taxes, generally speaking, right? You only have really seven mm -hmm. ways to lower taxes. Uh, but if you start a business and you're hopefully making a profit and monet potentially down the road monetizing with really within three years, because you have a couple of rules with that, with the IRS, then yeah, it's a business. So what can you right. do as an example, if you're running a business, you can make a bunch of deductions. You can deduct your, in some cases, your phone, well, usually your phone, a computer, your internet service, the phone, uh, the lights for your uh, podcast. And if you want to take a trip and do a podcast from, uh, I live in Washington, you want to go to California and do the podcast from there because there's a certain, whatever attraction there that would potentially yeah. be deductible. So there's a lot of things you can deduct as a result of being a podcaster, which is just really hopefully yes. marketing something, your podcast. So yeah, I mean, I'm and tying it all the way back. I'm kind of proud of myself yeah. for doing that. Yeah. And you can write off your virtual assistant. Don't forget. And you can write off your virtual assistant. That's exactly right. Um, and the fees that you use to pay them. So yeah, everything gets written off, which so is are your Are your fees deductible? If we, let's say I bring you on, or no, let's say I'm a client of yours. Uh, are my uh, uh, fees deductible to me? Absolutely, because it will be considered educational on your tax return. Is that right? Nice. I like how we brought this all together, man. <laughs> yes. Um, how about one last time? How do we get a hold of you or how does someone get a hold of you if they're interested in anything? In the free free yeah. item, by the way? Yes. 
So if you'd like the free guide, um, double your income with a marketing virtual assistant, you can go to outsourcingforbosses.com, outsourcingforbosses.com. If you would like to reach out, just learn more about us, you can check out our website, which is sixfigurebusinesscoaching.com. That's S-I-X, figurebusinesscoaching.com. And there, there'll be lots of free resources and there'll be a couple of links if you want to book a call with me. I love nothing more than chatting with people to figure out if what we do is the right fit for them. Man, guys, this has been helpful. Hopefully this has uh, added some value. If you want anything, uh, you need some inf information, uh, maybe some advice about podcasting or whatever the case is, obviously go to her, uh, her, her contact points. If you, any, if you have anything about taxes, estate planning, et cetera, et cetera, go to vastsolutionsgroup.com. It's been a pleasure. Once again, my name is Kenner French. It's been a pleasure doing this with you guys. Hopefully we're going to, you know, before I sign off, I'm going to make you promise me something. I feel like we should do this one more time. I agree. This has been a lot of fun. I'd love to have the conversation again. Absolutely. Sweet. And, and maybe next, you, can keep, you can keep me out of IRS jail. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> All right, cool. Next time we're going to go over even more unique stuff, uh, adding value. I totally appreciate it. Thank you, Kenner. All right. So, hey, guys, I really appreciate you guys spending the time. I know you could be watching and listening to a lot of other stuff, but this really will put money in your pocket. Kenner French, I'm out, guys. <laughs>